whose name is Dick, he's in hospice care at home. So please keep him and Cheryl and all the people who love them in your prayers. Thanks. In happier news, happy last day of Clergy Appreciation Month. While we appreciate our pastors all year long, this month provides a special opportunities to say thanks, and I encourage you to do that. And happy Halloween. It's fun to see all the, well, wonder women and goblins and kitty cats and all that in the sanctuary with us this morning as the children are joining us um, here in the sanctuary rather than being in Sunday school. Also, note that today all of our youth from grades 6 through 12 will meet from 1 to 3 this afternoon for a spy pumpkin palooza. More on what, what that means is in the bulletin, so uh, it sounds like fun, but check it out. Next Sunday is All Saints Sunday, when we gather to remember and celebrate the lives of those who we miss. If you have lost family members since November 1st, 2020, you're invited to share that information for inclusion in a special memorial booklet. There are details in the bulletin to provide information to Aaron in the office, and note that that needs to be there by this Wednesday, November 3rd. Also next Sunday, we'll enjoy a sneak preview of the craft fair that's being held on Sundays, November 14th and 21st in the Octagon. Donations are being accepted now, so if you've got your crafting work done, please consider donating those for sale. Other news, including our new Monday evening adult discussion group, sale of White House Christmas ornaments, our next hunger ministry distribution on November 8th, and sadly, the fact that the United Methodist men will not hold an apple sale this fall is ready for you in this morning's bulletin, in the weekly email news, and of course online at www.stpaulsk.org. And finally, a quick reminder that Montgomery County is headed back towards mask mandates and we are going to continue to keep our masks on here in the sanctuary. Thanks. Now, as we prepare our hearts for worship, we welcome you, whether you join us in person or online, in costume or not, whether you worship with us every week or join us today for the first time, whatever your sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, Whatever your race, nationality, age, ability, education, or station, you belong with us here at St. Paul's, and we greet you as we worship in the name of Jesus Christ. Thanks.
Please stand as you are able for the call to worship. God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the waters surge.
please join me in the opening prayer. The world can be a scary place, and we are afraid. Afraid of what we do not know. Afraid of things that go bump in the night. Afraid of the darkness that lingers as the seasons change. Afraid to be hurt by tricks or hooked by treats. Lord, let your light shine into every darkness. Deliver us from evil. Give us hope. Grant us courage. Let your light shine like a candle in a jack-o'-lantern, illuminating us from the inside out. Good morning. morning. Lest you may be fooled, I am Pastor Pat (laughs) and not a turtle. (sighs) Greetings. This is the day that God has made and we are absolutely delighted to be a part of it. And we've come to that moment of many moments in our day and in this opportunity where we come to settle, even though we may have on different attire but we come to settle into the sacred space of knowing that God is God, that we come to give thanks for what God has done, that we come to lift before God those things that are weighing our hearts down. We come before God just to say, God, we're glad to be alive this morning. So as we remember those who have been lifted up through our announcements, the Woodside family, uh, the Crump family, the Warner family, as we remember those who are ill and on our sick list, as we remember each and every one of us who each probably carry our own stuff that nobody else but God knows about, I invite you to offer those as the gifts, your concerns and your celebrations as gifts before God as we pray. So let us pray. Holy and amazing God, you are the God who looked into the future and saw this day And God, you invited each and every one of us to be a part of it. God, we were not invited because we perfectly fit the part or that we had done all things well, but we were invited to be a part of this day because you love us that much, that you could not open this day without us. But lest we be too full of ourselves, let us be reminded that you are still God that you're the one that holds this day, you control this day. There's no way we can have any inkling or idea what the day will give us, what the day will offer us. But we do know this, that you are God with us in this day. So God, for those who are feeling under the weather or feeling the effects of life, those who are struggling, we ask God for your strength, your compassion, and your peace to, to envelop them. For those, God, who are celebrating victories in life and celebrations of birth and overcoming illnesses and promotions and marriages, we give you thanks, God, and invite you into those celebrations that you would pour your joy and your love abundantly. And for those, God, of us who are just glad to be alive, glad for one more day, that last night was only a dress rehearsal, that this is the day that you've made and that we get to be a part of it, we give you thanks. And let us remember that no matter whether we have on turtle ears or rabbit tails, no matter whether we are in choir robes or clergy collars, no matter whether we have on cat whiskers or marble shields, you created us and therefore we are created in your image, perfect in your sight with all the trappings, without all the dressing up. You love us for who we are. And for that, we give you thanks. Now, as Jesus taught the disciples, let us join in one as, and pray the prayer that reminds us that none of us can do life by ourselves and we cannot live life without you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Good morning. I'm not a cat, dressed like one, but I'm Rachel Stalkup. I'm the chair of the Staff Parish Relations Committee, or the SPRC. And I'm Mars Higgins. I serve on the SPRC, and I'm also the lay leader here at St. Paul's. On behalf of the SPRC and the entire congregation, we would like to take a moment to recognize our bunny today, Pastor Kate. <laughs> Pastor Kate, would you please come up here? The process to become an ordained minister in the United Methodist Church is not a short one. As I was learning more about it, I read this quote, it is not for the impatient. <laughs> you have worked years for this moment, years of ministry, of spiritual study and diligence, of reflection, of strengthening your relationship with church, God, and all of us, and we are blessed to be part of that journey. Pastor Kate, perhaps you felt a lot of good vibes this past Wednesday as you were being ordained by the United Methodist Church. The whole St. Paul's community prayed for you, and many of us were lucky enough to watch it live with the miracle of technology. Today, we'd like to present you with some gifts of congratulations. As you may already know, the flowers on the altar are dedicated to you, but we, have, we also have solicited support from the congregation and we're amazed at the outpouring of love and support. So today we have for you a set of stoles, an engraved hymnal, a gift card to Cokesbury, where I understand you can buy new pastoral wear and a love offering from the congregation. Can we please take a moment to stand and applaud Pastor Kate's accomplishment? Pastor Kate, we know that this is a momentous occasion and the culmination of a lot of work, but we also realize it's the beginning of a new spiritual journey for you. And all of us at St. Paul's continue to stand by you, to pray for you, and to wish you well as our newly ordained minister. exciting. <laughs> Our scripture today takes us into what I think is unfamiliar territory, the Apocrypha. It's um, from Daniel chapter 14 verses 1 through 30 and it's quite a yarn as you will see. When King Astyages was laid to rest with his ancestors, Cyrus the Persian succeeded to his kingdom. Daniel was a companion of the king and was the most honored of all his friends. Now the Babylonians had an idol called Baal and every day they provided for it 12 bushels of choice flour and 40 sheep and six measures of wine. The king revered it and went every day to worship it, but Daniel worshiped his own God. So the king said to him, why do you not worship Baal? He answered, because I do not revere idols made with hands, but the living God who created heaven and earth and has dominion over all living creatures. The king said to him, do you not think that Baal is a living God? Do you not see how much he eats and drinks every day? <laughs> and Daniel laughed, like you guys, and <laughs> said, do not be deceived, O king, for this thing is only clay inside and bronze outside, and it never ate or drank anything. Then the king was angry and called the priests of Baal and said to them, if you do not tell me who is eating these provisions, then you shall die. But if you prove that Baal is eating them, Daniel shall die because he has spoken blasphemy against Baal. Daniel said to the king, let it be done as you have said. Now there were 70 priests of Baal besides their wives and children. 
So the king went with Daniel into the temple of Baal. The priests of Baal said, see, we are now going outside. You yourself, O king, set out the food and prepare the wine and shut the door and seal it with your signet. When you return in the morning, if you do not find that Baal has eaten it all, we will die. Otherwise, Daniel will, who is telling lies about us. They were unconcerned because beneath the table they had made a hidden entrance through which they used to go in regularly and consume the provisions. After they had gone out, the king set out the food for Baal. Then Daniel ordered his servants to bring ashes and they scattered them throughout the whole temple in the presence of the king alone. Then they went out, shut the door, and sealed it with the king's signet and departed. During the night, the priests came as usual with their wives and children, and they ate and drank everything. Early in the morning, the king rose and came and Daniel with him. The king said, are the seals unbroken, Daniel? He answered, they are unbroken, O king. As soon as the doors were open, the king looked at the table and shouted in a loud voice, you are great, O Baal, and there is no deceit at all. But Daniel laughed and restrained the king from going on. Look at the floor, he said, and notice whose footprints these are. The king said, I see the footprints of men and women and children. Then the king was enraged and he arrested the priests and their wives and children. They showed him the secret doors through which they used to enter to consume what was on the table. Therefore the king put them to death and gave Baal over to Daniel, who destroyed it and its temple. Now in that place, there was a great dragon, which the Babylonians revered. The king said to Daniel, you cannot deny that this is a living God, so worship him. Daniel said, I worship the Lord my God, for he is the living God, but give me permission, O king, and I will kill the dragon without sword or club. Hmm. The king said, I give you permission, then Daniel took pitch, fat, and hair, and boiled them together and made cakes, which he fed to the dragon. The dragon ate them and burst open. Then Daniel said, see what you have been worshiping? When the Babylonians heard about it, they were very indignant and conspired against the king saying, the king has become a Jew. He has destroyed, destroyed Baal and killed the dragon and slaughtered the priests. Going to the king, they said, hand Daniel over to us or else we will kill you and your household. The king saw that they were pressing him hard and under compulsion, he handed Daniel over to them. This is the word of the Lord.
All right. For those of you that may not know me, my name is Micah Smart, and I am the Minister of Youth and Design here at St. Paul's. Um, before we get started, I know people are going to ask, yes, I am dressed as a big nerd, but that's not any different from any other day. What sets apart today is the candy strapped to my pants. They are Smarties. So, I am Smarty Pants. It's a double pun because my last name is Smart. So any pants that I wear are Smarty Pants. <laughs> All right. What special thing is today? Great, I didn't even have to make you do more. Um, right, indeed, it is Halloween. And for Halloween, I thought we would dig into a part of the Bible that we don't often use. In fact, as Methodists, we, we almost never use this. Uh, it's not that we don't like it, it's just way more complicated than I want to get into this morning. Uh, so, we won't. <sighs> Smarties keep falling off my pants. <laughs> These scriptures that we read from this morning are taken from what we call the Apocrypha. They're extra texts that we don't quite often use. Uh, specifically, our readings are an extra part to the book of Daniel. Te technically, if we were to use them where they go in this part of the story, it's right before Daniel gets thrown in the lion's den. And are some of the actions that the reasons we are given to why Daniel is thrown in there in the first place. Now, if you had trouble following the story, don't worry. I'm going to recap a lot of it before we get into the rest of the sermon. A long time ago, there was a city called Babylon, and they began an expansion. They started taking over neighboring countries until they had become a great empire. And eventually, they took over Israel and Judah and took a lot of the people from those countries and moved them all out all over the empire. One of the people that they brought to Babylon was Daniel. Daniel became sort of a religious advisor and friend to the king. In these extra portions of Daniel's story, Daniel refuses to worship an idol, a statue that they call Bel. The king is certain that Bel exists because he leaves offerings for it. There's a lot of food and a lot of wine, and Bell seems to eat those things and consume them, and it is, he is left empty. His area, his room, is wiped clean every day. Daniel knows something fishy is going on, so he proposes sort of a test. If he wins, he gets to live. If he loses, he dies. Uh, the priests that attend to Bel accept this offer. And so they perform all of their rituals for this idol, and then they leave for the day. The king gives his normal offering, sets it out on the table, and before they leave, Daniel has his servants scatter ash all over the floor. And then the king and Daniel close the door and leave a wax seal on the door to make sure no one goes in. In the morning, the king rejoices. He sees that the seal has not been broken, that no one has gone into the room, and all the food appears to be gone. But Daniel points out to the ground. He says, look, there are footprints leading in and out of a, a secret entrance, kind of like Scooby-Doo. The priests of Bel and their families have been coming out from underneath the table, taking all the food for themselves, and then leaving. And so Daniel wins. Then they have another contest. There is a large serpent, a great dragon, what they call it, uh, a living, breathing entity. And obviously, because it's so big and so powerful, they should worship it as a god. But Daniel says that this is no god. He can kill it, and without a sword. So instead, he makes some sort of cake or, or bread-like substance 
out of some really gross ingredients. He uses hair and tar and all sorts of weird stuff. Well, the dragon looks at these cakes, thinks, ooh, those look delicious, eats them, and then basically explodes. And once again, Daniel wins. That's where our stories from Scripture this morning end. That This is the reason that is given to throw him to the lions. He made enemies of the people that worshipped these other idols. What you may not know about today, though, is that it's also what we call in the Protestant Church Reformation Day. This day marks the day that Martin Luther sort of accidentally started the Protestant Reformation. What he did is he nailed his 95 theses, 95 reasons, to the door of his local church on All Hallows' Eve, on Halloween. Now, why would Martin Luther nail papers to a church door? Well, he was angry about a lot of things. A lot of things were, were a little sketchy in the Catholic Church at this time. Uh, perhaps one of the biggest things was this practice that they called selling indulgences. Indulgences were basically get-out-of-jail-free cards, except the wealthy people paid these indulgences to get rid of their sins. In, in theory, the Catholic Church is then supposed to take all that money that they're getting from these wealthy people trying to get rid of their sins and then distribute it to the communities to help them feed people that need it. But instead, it was going to the top church officials and they were using it to live extremely wealthy lifestyles. In some ways, these three stories from today all have one common thing, and that's eating. Now, I'll give you that Martin Luther's story is kind of a stretch, but hear me out. Martin Luther wasn't trying to start a revolution necessarily. He just wanted to stop feeding the Catholic Church more than its fair share. He wanted the money that the church was receiving to go back out into the communities instead of hoarded by the people in charge. Don't get me wrong, there were tons of other things that Martin Luther was really upset about. But today, let's just focus on this portion of it. He saw an overfed Catholic church neglecting to be the light of Christ in that world at that time that he was living in. So we should ask ourselves a question. It, maybe it's a familiar question. If any of you have ever looked after a toddler, you may have asked this question. What's in your mouth? What are you eating? Usually this is followed by a phrase like, spit that out or, or give that to me. You see, when we are young, we have this impulse to just put things into our mouths, whether it's food or not. Most of the time we don't really know what we're doing, but obviously this action can have some dire consequences. Which is why we try to make sure that we are eating only good things, healthy things, for the most part. I say for the most part because it is Halloween. And I know that many of us in this sanctuary are looking forward to eating some candy tonight. I know I am. I love candy. I have a major sweet tooth. Uh, there are some candies that I really, really love. Reese's pumpkins, gummy worms, those mallow cream pumpkins that nobody seems to like except for me. Uh, Smarties, basically anything blue raspberry flavored. I, I could go on and on and on, but let's just say that Halloween is a great time for me. But as much as I love candy, I know that I can't only eat candy, right? If I did that, it would make me sick. That's why we eat other things like meat and vegetables and fruits and breads and cheeses. We get different things from all these, from all these um, foods that help us be healthy, to help our bodies function correctly. If we ate only candy, we would get sick to our stomach and, and probably develop all sorts of weird medical conditions. In the same way, we can get spiritually sick when we consume other things that are in the world. It's not that the other things are necessarily bad things or things that are bad for you, it's just that when we eat too much of one thing, 
and not enough of other things. We aren't getting everything we need to live a healthy life. Let me try to explain it another way. You may have noticed my little buddy up here. This is my jack-o'-lantern that I carved last night. He represents us. See, he's, he's very happy. He's got a smile. The light inside represents Christ's light within us. When it shines, others can see it through us. The light is made stronger, bigger, brighter the more we work on our relationship with God. Through prayer, through study of scripture, through worship, through service, etc., etc., etc. But we don't only do God related and church related things every waking moment. We have a whole world that God created for us filled with all sorts of wonderful things. Things that can be good for us, things that bring us a lot of joy, sort of like candy. So, for instance, work. Now, I may be a bad example for this because I work here, and therefore I have a lot more time to do some God-related things. But I also do things like design work. I do some, some technical work on our computers around here. I have emails and communications that I have to do. I come up with games and studies and retreat things and all sorts of other scheduling minutia. Some of you have school. Some of you have other so sorts of jobs, stuff that takes up time. And then we have things like our hobbies. Things that I like to do are like block printing with linoleum. I like spending time outdoors. I like baking. In the winter, I like to snowboard when I can. I, I keep up with various TV shows and superhero movies. So there's already a lot of candy here. For some people, some people really like sports. I'm not so big on sports, but my fantasy football team is doing very well this season, so it gets a couple of pieces of candy. And then we have relationships with the other people in our lives, our, our families. So, like my wife. She gets a lot of candy. <laughs> I love you. My family gets candy. My friends get candy. My youth get candy. Oh yeah, my coworkers get candy. Some people, we have to put a lot of time and effort into maintaining those relationships. And so those especially difficult people get a little bit more candy. <laughs> now, all of these things aren't necessarily bad, right? These things are things that bring us joy, things that we like. This isn't even the stuff that we put onto our bodies that are bad for us. And we all have some of those things. Now, your pumpkin may not look exactly like this. Uh, technically, I wouldn't score myself in exactly this way either because the light is out. You can't see any light from in here. But that just demonstrates how easily it can be to become overwhelmed and neglect our time with God. Our worship, our prayer, our gathering together as a community are all important. And when we neglect those things, our light becomes buried. It's still there, but it becomes more like another filler to the pumpkin, a little checkbox of things that we are, but don't really see much from. People can look at us, but they don't necessarily see that light. All these things are blocking that light. We've made these other parts of our identity idols, things that get in the way of God. Okay, so we, we know this is a problem, right? The question is, what do we do about it? How can we fix this? 
Maybe. It's about rearranging things, making showing that light more of a priority. For instance, we could move it on top of some of these other things to make sure that other people see it. Reprioritizing with being involved with God. This method isn't necessarily about finding balance because when you find balance, you're kind of teetering. It's about finding stability. It's about making these other things work for you to, to stabilize your relationship with God, to show that light. It's about finding a way of doing the things you've already got going on in a way that shows people Christ. Or maybe it's giving up a couple things. Scaling back. Making more room for that light to shine. I get it. We are all busy people. And we are taught from an early age to fill up our time and energy with as much possible. Maximize efficiency. Do more. Fill every waking moment with something. Keep to your schedule. Sometimes it's, it's hard to hear, but maybe filling ourselves to the brim with activities isn't what God really wants for us. Maybe we need to take some time to slow down, breathe, let go of things that are demanding more and more from you without giving anything back in return. Or maybe, maybe it's not about the other things that you're feeding yourself with. Maybe it's more of a question of how are you feeding your light instead? Maybe it's working on making this light bigger and brighter so that it can be seen even with all the other things you've got going on. The bigger and brighter that light is, the easier it is for people to see. And the easier it gets to handle all those other things in our lives. When that light touches these other things, it can reflect that God light. So that our work, our hobbies, our relationships, all those things that we do may be done for God's glory. And both Daniel and Luther knew this well. They let their actions show God's light through the things that they did. Daniel never really boasted or bragged when he won his contests. When he proved the king wrong about Bel, he was fairly humble. You could tell that he did it out of love for God and love for the king, his friend, his neighbor. Sure, he wanted the king to only worship God, but he let his actions speak. He showed that the priests of Bel were cheating and hoarding the food for themselves. He never bragged about being able to slay the dragon without a weapon. He simply did what needed to be done to show that God was more powerful and to keep people safe. It wasn't so much about his words in this story. Rather, he showed what was important to him with his actions. Now, admittedly, Martin Luther used a lot more words. But similarly, he showed that God and his neighbor were important to him. So important that he nailed 95 reasons that the church was doing things wrong and could be doing so much better. It did not make him any friends. In fact, the church was really mad. They kicked him out. And he had to start his own church in protest. Which is why we call them Protestant or Protestant because they protested the way things were being done. He wanted to follow God more fully and led others to do the same, to fill themselves up with the light of Christ, despite the other things they had going on. Friends, that's what we are called to do, to let the light inside of us shine not hidden behind all the other things that make us who we are, 
That's why figuring out what we are eating is so important. We can continue to feed ourselves the things of this world. And, and a lot of those things are not necessarily bad. But they aren't everything. If we neglect that light within us, we can get sick. Just like eating too much Halloween candy. So this Halloween, let's just all agree to watch what we eat. May it be so. Let us pray. Holy and amazing God, we give you thanks 
for the privilege and opportunity to give. God, it is amazing that you can take a little and ha do a lot. It's amazing that how you take what we give from our hearts and make it do more than we could ever imagined. So for those who are able and blessed to give, God, we give you thanks for their faithful and loving and willing giving. And for those, God, who want to give but cannot, for whom giving is not an opportunity that they can embrace at this moment, let them never feel that they have no value. Let them be reminded that all are precious in your sight and that God is not by how much we give but from where we give, not from our pockets, but from our hearts. So God, remind us that as long as our giving, no matter our gifts, is with love and in response to your love for us, it is well received. We thank you for the privilege, the opportunity, the gifts, and all givers. It's in the name of Jesus the Christ that we pray. Amen. I let y'all go. There are a couple of announcements. We'd like those who came in costume to join us out front for a picture before you leave. We also would like to invite everybody out in front of the church. We have a small reception of cider and apple juice if you would like to partake. Uh, we hope that you will join us. Now receive this benediction. Go now into the world, carrying with you your light. Let it shine from within you like a jack-o'-lantern. Go in peace. Go in Christ. Amen. Amen.